We have every letter between Blanche and Warney, including postcards that they sent to one another when they were on vacation. So I was excited by it just because it's such a a rare historical artifact. To have a complete correspondence from the first to the last is virtually unheard of. I'm William O'Flaherty, and welcome to All About Jack and the Knowing and Understanding C.S. Lewis YouTube channel. Dr. Diana Glyer joins me to discuss a book she edited entitled The Major and the Missionary. It contains letters from C.S. Lewis's brother Warren, a retired Army major, to a lady who was a medical missionary. Warren, also known as Warney, is a lesser-known Lewis, but, uh, you know, 2023 seems to be his year, as this is the second book related to him that has been released. Well, welcome back to the show, Diana. It is a pleasure to be here, William. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Always glad to have you on the show. Well, now, before we get into The Major and the Missionary, the book you edited, I'd like you to answer this question. What are people missing by not knowing more about Warren Lewis or only being aware of a very small component of his life? Mm, That's a great starting question. So I guess I would invite you to think about what it would be like to have your entire life defined by someone else. So imagine you have a famous parent or maybe a famous sibling or spouse um, let, let me let me put it this way. There are two books published about Warren Lewis, and both have brother in the title, defining him in relation to his brother or as a brother. But I've never seen a C.S. Lewis book that defines him as somebody's brother. So this idea of being defined by someone else, I think, is an inherent problem when we're trying to deal with this. But There's so much to know about about Warren Lewis particularly. So imagine this. Imagine that you are a famous historian, someone who's written seven books about France during the reign of Louis XIV. All of these books are extremely well-written and insightful. Some of them are in print decades after they were published. But all of this writing is ignored simply because compared to your famous brother, you didn't write about topics that are as universally interesting or uh, noticed. And so think about what that would be like to be in the shadow. So I'm really glad to think about this talented writer, this historian, whose work as a writer begins with his childhood stories and plays and poems that he wrote uh, when he was little, that stories that he wrote in in collaboration with his brother, Jack. Um, In fact, those early stories, I think, are so important that the case could be made that we wouldn't have C.S. Lewis if we didn't have these early uh, collaborations. So I would have to say I'm really grateful that Don King has finally written a full biography of Warren Lewis. And I hope that my book will contribute also uh, a little bit more of a well-rounded view of Warren Um, maybe highlighting his personality and his accomplishments outside the shadow of his famous brother. Very good. Well, now, your book uh, merely covers less than the last five years of Warney's life, but one of your endorsers noted, quote, in addition to the considerable human drama revealed by this correspondence, it also possesses historical and educational value. And then the person gives a few general examples. Now, before actually exploring those (laughs) elements, though, what do we learn, maybe even indirectly, about Warney and his relationship with his more famous brother? We learned so many details about Warren Lewis. And the reason that this is so powerful, I think, is because what I've presented here are his letters, the firsthand letters And that gives the reader the opportunity to read them for themselves, to make up their own minds about the kind of person that Warren Lewis was. I'm really privileged as a scholar to be able to visit archives and special collections and go digging through all those primary documents. That's what I do for my summer vacation, right? (laughs) But not everybody has those privileges. And so a lot of times the average person has to rely on the work of others in order to explore or explain these people. What I think we see in these letters 
is the opportunity for readers to have some of the joy of studying original letters and, and making up their own minds. So what do we particularly observe? What, what do we particularly see in this last five-year period, in this period of Warren Lewis's life? I would say that when you look at things like his diary or other letters or biographies that we have, biographical sketches that we have, most of the available material we have about Warren Lewis, it, it shows him in the company of other men or in direct relationship to his brother. So when you think about that, that's a very limited kind of view and it raises questions for me. So here's some of the questions that I think the major and the missionary helps us to grapple with. Um, for one of them, how does Warren Lewis address people who are not part of his inner circle, of this group of the Inklings or his relationship with his brother? How did Warren Lewis treat new correspondence? Uh, how does he interact with women? A and what do the letters have to say when Warren Lewis is not writing on behalf of C.S. Lewis, when he's not answering his brother's fan letters, but a fan letter that he receives from a reader. Um, the other thing we get to see, I think, here is what life was like for Warren Lewis when he lived alone at the kilns after his brother has died. Uh, what were those years like? I think that this gives us a little window into that season uh, of his life as he's grappling with the huge question, how do I honor my brother's legacy? Well, now I want to get to the more personal aspects uh, of the letters between the major and the missionary in a bit, but let's go back to that historical and educational value element that one of your endorsers mentioned. Reflect on what the reader might learn from this snapshot of the late 1960s and early 1970s from two people who weren't caught up in the latest trends of those times, but we're still aware of some current events. You know, when I think about the historical value, really the, the historical impact of the letters between Blanche and Warney, uh, I'm reminded of the Ken Burns documentary on the Civil War. Are you, are you familiar with that, William? Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I think it's brilliant. But when you think about that series, do you remember how often in that documentary series, we hear excerpts from Civil War soldiers themselves. We hear their firsthand accounts the night before a battle, as they're sitting on the battlefield, as they're sewing their names into their clothing so that if they die, the bodies will be identified. I mean, you think about these uh, people who are right in the midst or the thick of things and how so much of the power of that documentary series, it comes to us because we have these incredibly articulate and beautiful and poignant letters written by people who were there. I think that when you read The Major and the Missionary, you'll see some of that same quality, people who are right in the thick of life, who are right in the midst of things, sharing their experience, both Warney and Blanche are very, very articulate writers. They're really, really good observers of life around them. And they're both very strong Christians. And they talk about their Christian faith and their Christian life and their Christian practice. Um, in the process of getting to know one another, they are talking about a lot of current events. Uh, they talk about the attempted uh, murder of Pope Paul the the Sixth. They talk about Senator uh, Ted Kennedy and Chappaquiddick, Malcolm Muggeridge's controversial television appearances. They, they talk about the abdication of Duke Windsor from his throne. And one of the things that's really interesting is they are um, watching the Apollo 11 lunar landing and they are really, really concerned about this event, not because they're resistant to space exploration, but because they're horrified by the cost <laughs> and what, how this um, money might have been spent differently. Uh, so these are some of the current events or newsworthy events that are mentioned in these letters in one way or another. But Blanche Biggs is a missionary doctor serving in Papua New Guinea. And she's also facing a particular tragedy that happens during the season of these letters uh, right where she is. Um, and that is the uh, eruption of the Mount Lamington volcano. 
And she's affected by this very directly. This volcano eruption killed more than 4,000 people. And her hospital made room for more than 1,000 additional patients who were sick, injured, or displaced by that volcano blast. And so, again, we have this sort of boots on the ground, firsthand experience of reflecting on these historical events, but also responding and being affected by some of these various um, current events that are, are happening. Now, the, the letters begin in, in late 1968, and as you mentioned, Blanche Biggs is the name of the individual that wrote to Warney. She's seeking out some practical advice. She thanks him for his work on what we know as the Letters of C.S. Lewis, and that came out in 1966. But now, in less than two years later, their relationship is clearly on more friendly terms. However, zero in then on, on this early part prior to them becoming uh, more friendly in their exchanges and highlight some of what um, you want people to uh, take away from this period. Uh, that's right. So Blanche has just finished reading the letters of C.S. Lewis, which Warren Lewis had edited. And um, uh, if you'll allow me, I can, I'd like, I'd love to read an excerpt of her first letter to Warren. Would that be okay? Certainly, yes. So she starts out basically like this. She says to Warren, I hope that you have the patience in answering letters from strangers that your brother had. This letter is written from curiosity, but there is some sort of purpose behind it. I am just finishing the C.S. Lewis letters edited by you. And of course, I bought it only because so many others of his books have been a help to me. Your book rounds out one's mental picture of your brother in a most satisfying way. And now to my question, how did all those letters survive? Not many people store up old letters in this day and age. My curiosity is prompted by a similar situation. I am a born hoarder of letters, always with the feeling that they may be needed someday. Any letters of importance, I always type and keep a carbon. Now I have a 20 year collection stowed away and always have the intention at the back of my mind to have a burning campaign. But of course I never find the time. So that's the end of uh, this little section of her letters. Part of the fun of this whole project, William, has been that here we have a series of 87 letters, and the letters begin by asking, what is the value of letters? Should <laughs> letters be preserved? Will the thoughts and ideas in these letters be of any use in the future? So Blanche admits that she's a hoarder. She keeps everything, and she also keeps a carbon copy of the letters that she sends out. And she's considering a big old bonfire. Uh, she wants to burn them. And so right from the start, we have, well, but these letters must exist because there's a book. And so this wonderful um, value of these letters, Warren Lewis answers with incredible generosity, saying, no, 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 don't burn those letters, save them. And he suggests that someday these letters may be of value to future readers. Isn't that delightful? Mm, oh, yeah. To think about a book of letters that's about letters, about keeping letters, and, and also, if I may say, about the value of archives, of libraries, of special collections, and the very, very extraordinary people who work hard to make these things available for researchers like us to dig back through and find new insights and, and new information that we get to share. Well, now, it's a shame that we won't be able to really go through all the different things people can uh, take away from the uh, letters. My, my next question really just deals with the, the rest of them, but uh, feel free to elaborate and, and expound on different aspects here. But uh, considering then the, the remaining things in terms of when they do uh, get on more friendly terms, uh, what are some of the themes that stood out to you uh, that a, a reader uh, shouldn't miss? So uh, let me just talk a little bit about what I think of as the narrative arc of these letters. So when you think about picking up a letter collection, you think about sort of a random set of 80 or more letters that talk about a variety of things. But I think that what's striking about this, and, and, and William, I'd love your insight into this. What I think is striking about this is the fact that there's an incredible story 
that unfolds. Uh, they start as, it starts as a simple inquiry. Blanche wants to know, uh, are letters worth saving? Warren Lewis writes back and they talk about preserving letters, keeping them, and the value of these letters to future um, thinkers and readers. But it shifts pretty much from there to becoming pen pals and talking more about the facts of daily life. But then there's a there's a crisis at the hospital, the missionary hospital where Blanche Biggs is serving. And she decides to confide in Warren Lewis about the difficulties and the, and the struggles uh, that she's having as a key administrator and working doctor in limited resources and difficulties. This idea of them becoming confidants, I think, is really, really valuable. And uh, Warren Lewis is in a situation where he really doesn't have people he can confide in about the frustrations, the irritations, and the worries that besiege him. She doesn't have anybody that she can really talk to locally because she's the head administrator, and she can't really process the different uh, challenges that she's facing there on the mission field. They begin to confide in each other. And as they do, this, there's this deepening of their relationship. And then this wonderful affection that grows between them. In fact, that affection grows to such a level that the two of them make plans to meet. Um, Blanche Biggs starts dropping these wonderful hints <laughs> <laughs> that she has a furlough coming up. Warren Lewis completely misses the hint, goes straight over his head. So she tries again later. I have a furlough coming up. She says, in essence, I hear England is very beautiful in the spring. <laughs> and this time he picks up the hint and they make uh, these wonderful plans to meet. The story of what happens next and what Blanche um, experiences during her trip to Oxford, I'm going to leave that uh Unspoken for now, I'll encourage people to read the book and see how things play out uh, in that in that part of the story. So when I think about these letters, I think one of the first things I like to emphasize is this sort of narrative arc, this story, this deepening relationship between two uh, thoughtful, articulate Christians who are in a season late in life and who make the joyous discovery of friendship with each other. Right, and um, I'm wondering, uh, uh, there was a uh, age difference between the uh, two, and I'm I'm thinking that maybe on uh, Warney's end that he was, you know, he he, if I recall, because I because I, you did give me an advanced copy to read to prepare for the interview here, that uh, he's noting his age very upfront to where uh, he doesn't want maybe any unrealistic expectations. Obviously, they're you know miles and miles apart. So there's no real relationship that could in his mind probably develop, but uh, on her end, it seems like she's thinking about that, but he's rather uh, rather dismissive about it. Do you think it was because of that age difference? And do, do you recall what that age difference is? They're about 12 years apart in age. Um, mm -hmm. Blanche is a little bit, a little bit younger. You know, would, would you, would you indulge me just a moment of mm -hmm. speculation? I'm wondering if somewhere, either consciously or unconsciously, in the back of Warren Lewis's mind, if he's not realizing that his brother's happiest years were the years of his marriage uh, to Joy Davidman, and that love story began with letters. It began through correspondence. And I'm wondering if in some way, at some level, Warren Lewis is thinking, maybe this is my opportunity. Maybe this is my chance to find late in life the kind of love that my brother and, and Joy had uh, that began through a correspondence of letters. So you had asked me about uh, key themes, and there's a lot of them, but I think the one thing that I like to underscore is something that I call the miracle at the heart of the major and the missionary. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is uh, Warren Lewis, Warren and Jack, of course, uh, grew up in Ulster. And Warren Lewis was deeply disturbed by the troubles, right? That civil war in the 60s between Ulster and Ireland. 
Um, all of these IRA atrocities are happening, and he is in that process developing a deep hatred of Catholics and also at the same time guilt for hatred. But he's outraged by the kinds of bombings, shootings, and all the upheaval, and he doesn't know quite how to think about it. Blanche is very committed to um, an ecumenical perspective, all different branches of the Christian faith, learning to work together, because where she is on the mission field in Papua New Guinea, it's the best way to witness to the truth of the gospel, to learn to work together with people from a variety of perspectives. So this is a theme throughout much of these letters. She's advocating for working together for common good, putting aside differences and coming alongside, um, side by side, working for, toward, working toward common goals. He is resistant, absolutely putting, uh, <laughs> digging in his heels. He doesn't want, he, he just, just doesn't make sense to him. He's quite adamant that it's not possible, right? But then something happens. Uh, this miracle happens uh, in September of 1970. And again, if I could just read a little piece uh, from a letter from Warren Lewis, uh, this is kind of a moment of epiphany. So when you're reading the first uh, sets of letters, the beginning letters, Warren Lewis comes off it as a little bit crotchety, in fact, a little bit uh, sort of surprisingly almost hateful. But what he's hating is the violence. He's hating these events that are happening in his beloved homeland. But then in September 1970, this is what happens. He says to Blanche, I've been in hospital with a bad leg and thereby hangs a tail. Whenever I am in such places, I somehow or other acquire a sort of most favored nation status. And this was no exception. So there he is in the hospital. He's got gangrene and he is making friends with the nurses. When night nurse had made her rounds, staff nurse, her assistant and myself used to assemble for a jolly little coffee party in the nurse's office. She, a militant Shinner, i.e. a Southern Irish woman who advocates the use of the Republican army to coerce Ulster into a united Ireland, and her assistant, a Roman Catholic from Falls Road, Belfast, the bitterest fighting street in my unhappy town, and myself, third generation Protestant ascendancy, also from Belfast. Well, here are these people representing all of the different interest groups, right? in the troubles. And here's what Warren discovers. We got together like a house on fire. They discovered that disemboweling Roman Catholics formed no part of my religion. And I discovered that their stockings concealed feet and not cloven hoofs. And here's how Warren Lewis like concludes this moment. I, I really do think it's a, an epiphany and a kind of miracle. He says, if only there could be a bit more get together, how different Irish life might be. We all parted after our last meeting with a genuine regret. So, so do you see how remarkable this mm, is? Right. Here he is all caught up in all of these military and political kinds of uh, conflicts. But when he actually sits down after hours with actual people face to face, he has this sort of aha. And, and he concludes not only maybe I was wrong in how I was thinking about these abstract notions, but maybe the solution to people who have these deep differences is just a little bit more hanging out and talking and listening and learning and being together, maybe that's the most important thing for us if we want to move forward in times of deep difference. Mm, yes, very good. That's, that uh, is a very good turning point. Well, now, stepping back for a moment, uh, take us to around the time you discovered the letters and were mulling over the idea of whether or not they were worth trying to get published, and then how difficult was it to uh, get them published? 
I ran across these letters in 1998. At the time, I was doing research at the Wade Center, Wheaton College, and I was focusing on research for my book, The Company They Keep, uh, because I wanted to really get into deeply into accounts of what happened when the Inklings met in Oxford. Warren Lewis was a member of the Inklings, and he's a historian, and he is one of our best sources of information. So I was looking for any scraps that I could find in his letters about meetings of the Inklings. So a lot of times when people think about research, they think about like Indiana Jones, or they think about all of these dramatic aha moments that the movies show of scholars kind of finding the missing piece or the Holy Grail or whatever the thing is. But to be honest, primary research can be a little bit tedious. So I was spending several weeks at the Wade Center and I was going through box after box after box of letters and miscellanea uh, that was related to Warren Lewis. So I'd been doing this for a while. I uh, opened a box, I'm looking through these letters and all of a sudden I come across this letter from Blanche Biggs and I think, oh, this has been misfiled. There's a letter here to Warren Lewis, but it's from a missionary doctor. And I, I couldn't quite make sense of it, but I thought, oh, well, because it's a letter to Warren Lewis, they've just tucked it in here. But then I turned the page and I was absolutely astonished to see that there was an answer. So I know that this is gonna sound really funny, but it's really, really unusual when you're looking at primary documents to have both sides of the correspondence. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. There's a letter and there's a response because most of the time we have only the letters. I mean, think about the letters of C.S. Lewis, if you've read mm -hmm. that book. We have only Lewis's letters and we're left thinking, I wonder what the question is that he's responding to, right? Or I wonder what, why he's talking about this thing. I wonder what the person is asking. And we're always trying to fill in the other half of the conversation. And I thought, this is cool. Here we have two letters in a row, one that's sent and then one that's answered. Then I turned the page. Right. There was another one, three letters, four, five, 87 letters in all. And I was fascinated by this because it is so unusual. We have every letter between them, between Blanche and Warney, including postcards that they sent to one another when they were on vacation. And so we have this whole thing. So I was excited by it just because it's such a, rare artifact, a rare historical artifact, when you think about all of the artifacts of the past, to have a complete correspondence from the first to the last is virtually unheard of, not just in inkling studies, but in any field that you can imagine. So just seeing that one aspect, I was really drawn to this because it's so different from what we usually run into. Um, but the more I spent time with them, uh, the more I discovered that we don't actually write letters anymore. Do you know what I mean? We text mm -hmm. each other, we send quick emails, but letter writing as an art is something from the past. It too is a kind of artifact of a different age and how thoughtful, well-read, articulate individuals both of them authors, uh, go about corresponding in a time in history when to write a letter and send it, it may be two months, three months, in some cases four or five months before the letter arrives. Then they're read, read carefully and responded to with a kind of thoroughness and thoughtfulness that it, it's kind of a, of a mystery for us uh, these days, I think. And so I think that there's a value there. But the more I read it, the more I became really enchanted with getting to know Blanche Biggs better. She is remarkable. Her work on the mission field in and of itself deserves to be celebrated and uh, gives us, I think, deep insights, just as she hoped, into what it was like to be a missionary back in the day. Um, so that's how I found it. That's how I got intrigued with it. And that's when I started thinking about publication. Here, here's the, the issue, though. Um, I was working on my, my book, The Company They Keep, which tries to explore the inner workings of the Inklings. What would it have been like to be a fly on the wall listening to conversations uh, about the manuscripts that the Inklings were working on? 
And I made a commitment to finish that book. So I had a notepad as I was doing research where I wrote down things to explore later, ideas to come back to, issues to visit after I finished the book. Because if I hadn't done that, (laughs) I don't know that I ever would have finished the company they keep. And I just, I needed to be really disciplined and focus on getting that book finished. Here's the issue. I did come back to it later after um, Bandersnatch and Company They Keep were published. But if I had not done so, William, if I had at that moment pursued the major and the missionary, Blanche Biggs was still alive. I could have met her. Mm -hmm. I could have traveled to see her and sat down with her and gotten to know her personally. And I just... I don't know. I'm kind of kicking myself that mm. I had thought that far ahead uh, in order in order to do that. So that's a little bit of the story of the letters and why the potential that I saw in them. But finding a publisher that was hard um, because it's really hard to capture how moving and rare these letters are and what a wonderful story they tell. But I really do think that they are well worth publishing. I'm delighted that Rabbit Room Press caught the vision for these letters and for their story. And one of the great things about working with the Rabbit Room is that uh, Pete Peterson, who's the head of Rabbit Room Press, he is also a playwright. And he is really supportive of the work that I've done taking these letters editing them, streamlining the story, and producing a stage play that is based on this story of Blanche and Warney. I just got back from a trip to Nashville where we performed The Major and the Missionary, a love story, and it is really powerful on the stage. And uh, I hope that we'll have more opportunities to produce the stage play as well. But it was Rabbit Room Press that I think had the vision for how this could um, be changed in terms of different uh, ways of presenting this information. And they really caught the vision. uh, And I'm very, very excited about the book coming out. Excellent. Well, now shifting uh, some here, totally just uh, in terms of uh, whether or not people are familiar with your work. Now, you you mentioned your um, other two books, which uh, I believe I did interviews on both of them. Sometimes when I have people on so often, sometimes I I keep keeping track of who I had on for what is is difficult. But uh, so we'll have a link in the show notes for people to catch those interviews. But for those who are not familiar with you, what's the uh, 411 on you? (laughs) So I'm a college professor. I teach in a great books program at Azusa Pacific University in California. Uh, That's my day job. And teaching is my favorite thing to do. As a scholar, I've focused really all my life on the friendship of C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien and written two books about them. I'm trying to dig deep into two key questions in those books. Um, what did Lewis, Tolkien, and the Inkling say to each other? And then what difference did their conversations make to the work that they were doing? Um, I've, I've been inspired by my studies of Lewis and Tolkien, how different they were as people, as thinkers, as creatives, and how much they've gained from challenging each other. I think in lots of ways, they really brought out the best in each other. And so kind of jumping off of that, I've also done a series of lectures about intellectual hospitality, which is basically the way that people with very different points of view can learn to appreciate what others bring to the table. So those are um, that's a little summary. Those are some of the things I do. Yes, and that uh, last topic, the intellectual hospitality, I know I've shared with my latest on Lewis talk you've done. I, I think, well, you've done, uh, I'm sure, quite a few. I think you had done one not that long ago um, with the uh, C.S. Lewis uh, Foundation in the summer of 2022. And then a few years before that, you did something uh, on a similar theme. And I've shared uh, both of those so people can find those as well. Well, then uh, finally, in terms of finding you, uh, where can people uh, find you uh, online or, you know, to continue the conversation uh, or, you know, learn more about uh, your, your work? I uh, really appreciate you underscoring these intellectual hospitality lectures. So there are three of them and they're available on YouTube. And I hope that people will uh, take a look for those. They're fairly easy to find. I have a YouTube channel 
And there are other uh, videos available of various talks at various times. But for a look at what I do, uh, I think my website is a really good starting place, dianaglier.com. Well, thank you, Diana, for being on the show today. Thank you very, very much. Always a pleasure to talk with you. I trust you enjoyed my interview with Diana Glyer about the major and the missionary, the letters of Warren Lewis and Blanche Biggs. Again, I'm William O'Flaherty. My podcast, All About Jack, has been around for over 10 years. And on YouTube, my channel is called Knowing and Understanding C.S. Lewis. Be sure to check out my short feature there called The Latest on C.S. Lewis that focuses on timely and timeless information. Check the description or show notes for any links mentioned in the show today. Finally, everything I do related to Lewis is centralized at the website EssentialCSLewis.com. And in case you didn't know, I've written two Lewis-themed books. The misquotable C.S. Lewis was released in 2018. It examines 75 quotes credited to him that he either didn't write, or paraphrases of something he did, or without the context, could be misunderstood. In 2016, my enhanced study guide to the Screwtape Letters came out. It's called, C.S. Lewis Goes to Hell. Thanks again for listening. Please consider liking and sharing this episode with others. <laughs>